Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the third, am I wrong? The third lecture of the University of Kent Public Lecture Series. And before introducing uh, our guest speaker today, I want to warmly thank Shubran Shumwishra and Natalie Gierke for their amazing work organizing these lectures. Uh, I think they are doing a wonderful job giving all of us the opportunity. Oh. Yeah. Good. That's what I expected from you. Giving all of us the opportunity to listen and interact with great thinkers on some of the most pressing issues of our time. After Robbie Shilliam, on October the 8th, who gave a lecture titled Decolonizing Academia, Lessons from a 19th Century Pan-Africanist. So you know that. You all were here. Right? And more recently, Oliver Richmond, who came and gave his thought on peace in the 21st century. I think it was in November the 12th. We have the pleasure today to welcome Professor Michael Dillon. Michael Dillon is an Emeritus Professor of International Politics at the University of Lancaster, UK. His short bio says he is researching on the problematizations of politics and war from the perspective of continental philosophy. The short bio, is, short bio goes on, explaining that he has been interested in what happens to the problematization of security when security discourses and technologies take life rather than sovereign territoriality as their reference object. Certainly, Professor Michael Dillon actually did and is still doing that. All this is reflected in most, if not all, of his writings from the now canonical Politics of Security, first published in 1996, to his forthcoming Biopolitics of Security, a political analytic of finitude. Michael Dillon has been obsessively and please believe that in my words it is positively connoted, has been obsessively interrogating our contemporary condition. And a third one can also find some of the results in his politics, security, and war, co-edited into it with my dear friend Andrew Neal, and his liberal way of war, killing to make life leave, co-edited with Julian Wade, I think it was in 2012. 11. But Nick, and you will pardon me for this more personal note, Mick is not just doing that. Or I should say, while doing that, while problematizing our present times, he has been doing so much more, in fact, especially contributing to open new spaces for other voices within the uncertain, nonetheless extremely powerful domain of knowledge we want to call international relations studies. Combined with the work of a few others, Mick's work can be looked at as a distributed system of knowledge subversion. That is, as a system that forces us to work hard to turn against themselves the categories of thinking through which we inhabit this world and act upon it. This activity implied, at some point, the de-disciplinarization of IR studies its pluralization too, by connecting IR to other domains of knowledge, mainly political philosophy, political theory, political anthropology, and also history, and here understood as the archaeogenealogical activity that consists in digging into the archive of our historical, historical epoch. In that sense, Mick is, in my view, Deeply Foucauldian, if you understand Foucault, as I do, that is, not just as a scholar, be it a philosopher, a historian, or whatever, not just as an author, neither, but also as, as we say in French, artificier. We could possibly translate that as a bomb disposal expert. An artificier that breaks the walls man needed to erect to better constitute nature, 
and himself as objects of knowledge, therefore to better govern the radically contingent nature of our history. Please join me welcoming Professor Michael Dillon, who will now present on Bush, Blair, and the Barak, the politics of and aesthetics of sovereign failure. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you, Philip. Uh, let me begin also by endorsing uh, Philip's uh, congratulations to Natalie and to uh, to Anshu. I've organized many conferences, many workshops, and so I know myself the amount of time and effort that goes into organizing them and hosting them. And I know that one of the principal things that makes them successful is the warmth of the hospitality that the organizers extend to the visitor and in this way. These two have been exemplary, so I, I'd like to add my uh, warm thanks to them. Uh, and also a very special thanks for uh, inviting uh, Philippe uh, Bonditi to chair me today. Philippe and I go back a very long way with enormous respect and admiration uh, for his scholarship and uh, much affection for him as a scholar. So it's, it's, it's almost sentimental for me that, uh, that Philippe is... Uh, is Cherry today. Thank you for coming for me. So uh, much appreciated. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you all for coming as well. Um, it's called Dark Day and um, it's an intimidating title. So let me begin my lecture with the opening sentence which remarks upon the title Bush Blair and the Barack The Politics and Aesthetics of Sovereign Failure. And let me read you a little quotation from Gilles Deleuze. Uh, this is the epigraph for the lecture, and you know that an epigraph is a short statement which, which you think captures something essential about what it is you're going to say. And this is what Deleuze say. says. It's from Deleuze's book on uh, Leibniz, the Fold, which is about the Baroque. And Deleuze says, the Baroque refers not to an essence, but rather to an operative function, to a trait. Okay. Introduction. A title can capture your attention in quite unanticipated ways. Bosch Blair and the Baroque has done precisely that to me. And it marks a turning point in my work as I leave behind one uh, book which is coming out in February and launch myself in a very uncertain way into a new project of reflection and analysis, though no doubt just as obsessively as the others. Uh, which surround uh, and, and, and are, are, are fertilized by the idea of Baroque politics. So this lecture, it's common when you give a lecture to say this is part of work in progress, this is part of a developing uh, set of reflections and to appeal to the audience to cut you some slack because it is a work in progress. I can't even claim yet that this is a work in progress. It's just a work that's beginning, the outlines and details of which, and the path down which it will take me are very uncertain to me, and yet I've become obsessed and possessed by the prospects of uh, developing an idea of modern politics, a redescription of modern politics as Baroque, in the process of which, because there's always a politics to a redescription, in the process of which uh, I want to make some claims about the analytical terms and, and, and concepts that we habitually use for the description and uh, interrogation of modern politics. Using the term Baroque allows me to make a maneuver uh, outside of those traditional uh, accounts of subjectivity, power, and so on. You'll see how, I hope, a little anyway, uh, as I go to the lecture. So this title, Bush, Blair, and the Baroque, was one I came up with about 18 months ago. And I came up with it simply because I liked the alliteration. <laughs> Bush, Blair, and Rock. I thought, that's a good title. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had no idea what it meant. And I had no idea how much I was beginning to invest myself in the relationship between a critique of certain political sovereigns, Bush and Blair, their activities, the concept of sovereignty as such, and the idea of the Baroque. Uh, it was just completely unanticipated. 
The Barak, I'll talk about it in a moment, but ordinarily the Barak is utilizes the term of abuse, the term of criticism, for overtly complex, elaborate, ornamental forms of art. Um, so if you refer to something as Barak, it's a criticism. And I suppose I meant that when I came up with the title of Bosch Blair on the Baroque. But since then I've learned that the Baroque is much more than that, and I'm trying to turn it into a term of political art and a term of political mm -hmm. critical engagement. So, I began in a rage with Bush and Blair, and with the sense that the ways in which they remain trapped in the theatrical orders of martial spectacle and Baroque political artifice that they'd scandalously employed to make disastrous war on Iraq and in Afghanistan raised profoundly important analytical as well as political questions. Questions that ran far deeper than those raised by their culpability and the ways in which their respective political systems allowed them to escape any accountability for it. What has continued to fuel this rage is the legacy of religious and political confusion, as well as hatred and war without end, that they so materially contributed to engender. The fatal irony, for example, of Blair's vainglorious Chicago speech of 1999 is precisely that in a radically interdependent world, mayhem elsewhere will come home to roost, and in more ways than one. The new cycles of death and destruction that their actions precipitated and fueled is one that has materially endangered the very societies in whose security interests they claim to act. Now I know perfectly well, as do you, that the mayhem has been long nurtured by indigenous historical, religious and political roots as well. Roots in which previous British and American imperialisms in the region have long been involved. It is a pity, as it were, a political scandal, in fact, that Bush Blair and their advisers willfully ignored or did not call for assessments that made precisely these and other related points before they embarked upon their war making. We now know, and uh, without benefit of the long-awaited Chilcot inquiry into the UK's participation in the Iraq war, that no effective consideration was given to post-war policy or the disastrous consequences that were likely to result from an invasion and occupation of Iraq. Blair is quite correct to say, the British and US policy was not the only cause. Such casuistry, self-serving as it is, is beside the point. It was indirect, material and contributory cause. As a direct result of their political leadership, the United States and the United Kingdom precipitated the radical destabilization not only of the Middle East, but, where Blair is concerned, to a considerable and still imponderable extent, that of the very union of the United Kingdom itself. My rage therefore emphasizes with those who would indict Bush and Blair for war crimes. But my analytical sensibility teaches me that while this would satisfy some spirit of revenge, it would have no prospect of bearing much better fruit analytically or historically than many of those liberal actions which were, in fact, deeply implicated in the war making. Once more, the question to which I was drawn concerned the nature of political artifice. In general, the theatricality, display and spectacle integral to its political machinations, and the complex religiosity and cultic character of political systems, namely those of the United States and the United Kingdom in particular, notionally secular, civilian, and rationally accountable. Above all, I remain intrigued by how digitaliz digitalization, molecularization, <coughs> And the generic power of code has been transforming this very stagecraft as much as its statecraft. Indeed, it's part of my point to insist that there is little distinction to be drawn between them. Statecraft has been stagecraft since the emergence of Baroque politics out of the late 16th and early 17th century. <coughs> Theatre, I note, is quite different from religious and imperial ritual. A different ontology, as well as technology and epistemology, attends it. Political theatre of the modern, in particular. That which so impacted European civilization from the Reformation onwards, the impact of its iconoclasms as much as its religious and political disputes and scientific progress on changing regimes of representation, has become my new 
political concern. And I give its problematization of politics, government, and rule the name Baroque, Baroque politics, for reasons that will become apparent, I hope, to some degree at least. Before I proceed, however, I want to make some final introductory points. Rules of truth and truths of rule are intimately correlated. Change the one, rules of truth, and you change the other, truths of rule, and vice versa. They're reversible. New modern rules of truth were never confined, however, to what Michel Foucault called the royal questions of power, those of constitution and so on. They concern the conduct, the conduct as much as ever they concern the foundations of political order. Rules of truth in terms of honestum, Latin term for honesty, truth, and real, were equally always related to the conduct of conduct, in post terms, in terms of an allied term to honestum, decorum. It was decorum that gave material form to honestum, and it always does. All rules of truth enjoin you to conduct yourself in some way in terms of self rule as well as in terms of the other world questions of power. Thus, where Foucault's micro politics of power, of governmentality and self governance were concerned, these always also related to veridical political apparatuses, truth telling and truth tellers on a large scale. One final additional corrective to Foucault. In advancing his argument about disciplinary society and taking aside swipe at Guy de Bourg, he proclaimed that the society of discipline had displaced the society of the spectacle. It was a typical exaggerated Foucaultian flourish. And it was as wrong then, when he made it, as it remains now. In his more sober moments, he readily admits as much. Modern power relations are plural, diverse, and changing. They describe no zero or some game in which one transcends another. Different relations coexist in complex patterns of government and rule from the micro to the macro levels of human conduct and behavior. And I take this lesson from Foucault himself. The spectacle is vital to power, military spectacle not least. So also is decorum, what Foucault called the conduct of conduct. There is now a field of formation to which you might even give the name digital decorum. And it concerns debates about the degree to which our societies have become societies of surveillance as much as they have become or remain societies of spectacle. Not the spectacle, to differentiate myself from Peter Paul, but spectacle in the world. There is nothing new about this in principle. Another reason why I call our politics by the term, by a term that may seem antiquated, but not. The difference lies in the details of the technologies, ontologies and epistemologies that underwrite our societies of both spectacle, discipline, normalization and surveillance, as well as sovereignty. For example, Foucault opened his magnum opus, The Order of Things, with a horrifically detailed account from the time of the execution of the regicide then ends in the mid 18th century by a Bourbon king. I forgot which one. It goes on for several pages, and Foucault does not spare any of the horrific detail of the, hang of the drawing and quartering uh, and execution uh, of, of this man. However, he uses it to throw it away and turn our attention to discipline and power knowledge. In that sense, I think he did us a disservice. I recall it here as an example of what we might call Bourbon shock and awe. And to remind us, one, that shock and awe has always been of concern to sovereign power. And that, two, spectacle concerns the corporeal body as much as it does the social or political body. And that, three, the enframing of it in the 18th century differs considerably from how it is wielded in the 21st century, not only because the technologies have changed, but also so have the ontologies and epistemologies of power relations which find their expression, or give expression to our contemporary ontologies and epistemologies. For our politics then, spectacle and display, not universally but historically expressed, I want to bring back to the centre of political theory and analysis, allying it in the process and by way of illustration to the theory and practices of security and war.
the obsession remains. <coughs> in short, despite my title, I'm not much interested in policy analytic post-mortems of Bush and Blair. I want to go backstage, so to speak, to see how the parts they played were scripted by the business of representation, specifically political representation as such. And in order to foreground debates about representation now so central also to debates about information, communication, surveillance, and media saturated societies in which we now live. To do that, however, I want to begin by illustrating the relevance of this redescription of modern politics as Baroque politics by showing how Bush and Blair, Blair especially, fit the political anthropology so clearly laid out in the Baroque drama of 17th century German tragic drama known as Trauerspiel, analyzed by the German thinker Walter Benjamin. The Baroque. Ordinarily addressed as a period and or a style of art and aesthetic, including painting, sculpture, and theatre, developed in Europe from the early 17th to the mid-18th century, the Baroque emphasizes dramatic, often strained effects, and typified, it is typified by bold, curving forms, tricks and marbles, contriving to combine ornamentation and overall balance between disparate parts. It was known for its extravagance and for its complexity and even bizarre and excessive ornamentation. The popularity and success of the Baroque style was encouraged, was encouraged by the Roman Catholic Church, which had reaffirmed the Church's teachings of the Council of Trent, and in response to the Protestant Reformation's challenge that art could and should communicate religious things. That had always been a long-standing issue about whether or not God, the deity, could or should be represented in artistic form, either through the word or through the image, and sometimes both. But the Baroque aesthetically was by no means confined to the aesthetics of the Counter-Reformation. Since there was a powerful Northern Protestant, as much as Southern Catholic, Baroque became, became popular and significant in the Low Countries, Netherlands, but also in the German states, and in Scandinavia. Similarly, the Baroque was never confined to the aesthetics. It was complexly allied to the changing landscape of power in Europe as it went through the religious, commercial and scientific, as well as political revolutions and bloody upheavals of the 16th and 17th centuries. The Baroque was never, therefore, merely art, as if there could be such a thing. It was always already from the very beginning a complex amalgam of politics with art and religion. The Baroque here, then, in my title and in my lecture and in my projected uh, inquiry, the Baroque here names instead, I'll forgot the expression, a space of problematization and a mode of operationalization, a trait, as you Deleuze described it. And it names that very space of problematization defined by a vast shift in the temporal and framing of politics, government, and rule at the end of the 16th and during the course of the 17th century, to which I've given the term factical rather than soteriological finitude. It was one characterized by how the retreat of the Christian God into the otherworldly obscurity of his inscrutable majesty had left a deficit in accounts of nature, human nature, and indeed, time itself. This deus abscondite, as his hand Blumenberg described it, resulted in a profoundly historically engendered lack, the absence of any transcendental intelligibility or ordering of the universe in general and of human affairs in particular. This lack had to be filled, and it was to be filled by human artifice. Filled not only in the field of knowledge, the modern epistemy, or even also in the field of social and political organization, I argue in my latest book, that of sovereignty and biopolitics in particular, the figures of man on the one hand and the figure of life as species being on the other hand. The point applied that the very constitution of modern individual selfhood, subjectivity, and to the very character of representation, including its performative as well as its scopic regimes of representation, from the rise of new theatre in the 16th and 17th centuries and art 
to the development of the telescope and of optics more generally, and the rise of scientific experimentation, as well as the spectacles of baroque politics in the courts of Catholic monarchs and Protestant republics like the Netherlands alike. There was, in short, here, no nature, no human nature, that was not comprised historically of this lack in the nature of nature as such, which gap had been left by the Deus of Scondites of Christian God. Culture, in terms of the whole gamut of human artifice, was summoned to bridge the gap. But at the same time, it was, of course, fated. Fated to fail, since there is no bridging the gap. The artifices of human design and desire played out, but they don't resolve it. In other words, the Baroque was a field of emergence, formation, and problematization, responding to a lack in the time bequeathed to it by the withdrawal of the Christian God. It was this historically emergent temporal lack of the advent of an understanding of time or history bereft of extra human guarantees as to its intelligibility or teleology, which I call practical finitude, that had been precipitated by the loss of faith, politically and socially at least, in the promised resolutions offered by Christianity's salvation history, or what I call soteriological finitude. In them, a new imperative arose that of having to give concrete political as well as epistemic form and behavioral conduct to a finitude, practical finitude, which was no longer understood to be informed and underwritten by a divinely ordered salvational order of things, a cosmos or a universe. Since there was no guaranteed form in nature, theistically or naturally, other than that which positivistic knowing was to draw from it through the astonishing powers of the epistemic, scientific, and technological devices that demand that nature show itself in forms consonant with the ways in which it was summoned to show itself through these techniques. Concrete form was either brought to nature or brought out of it in terms set by the new mechanisms through which it was epistemically and scientifically addressed. Hence, as a field of formation of problematization, the Baroque was neither fixed or determinate. No one Baroque. It was, as Deleuze correctly asserts in the epigraph that heads the lecture, and as many other contemporary students of the Baroque, Maraval to Eggington, Gall, Chen Morris, and many others agree, a changing manifold of formation and problematization responding to an historically induced sense of profound lack in nature, specifically, as it were, also in human nature, that was bequeathed by the dissolution of a soteriological understanding of finitudinal time and of how humans should be governed within this divinely ordered cosmos. This required that the lack thereby opened up be bridged by the genius of human artifice, not by human artifice as such, as if it transcended the ways in which it is manifested historically. The Baroque was distinguished less by a reliance upon artifice as such, therefore, than a reliance upon the radically changing forms and interpretations of representation and artifice introduced from the 16th and 17th centuries onwards by successive artistic, scientific, and epistemic revolutions of their allied novel rules of truth and truth of rule, especially those concerning politics, security, science, and dogma. The pathos, the pathos of modern mourning for this lack, for this absence of something towards which it expressed radical incredulity, has an order into it. Since what seems most characteristic of the, Baroque's, of the Baroque character of modern times is not lack, but the very pluripotency of this morphological, that is to say, some would argue it's pseudo-morphological, capacities. It's apparent infinite ability to experiment creatively with form and renew finite appearance, to infinitize finite things, by cracking the code of their very emergence and invention. In this instance, not just politically, economically, and culturally, but materially through the new sciences of representation. From digitalization through molecularization to electromagnetic image production. What inspired the political anthropology of the Baroque? The sovereign as tyrant, the sovereign as martyr, the sovereign in the midst of intriguers, and so on. 
a political anthropology drawn from the German Baroque dramas, was therefore the political temporality to which it gave expression in the fields especially of politics, government and rule, as well as representation in the arts, science and literature. Indeed, the entire ordering of representation was thus set in play in ways not only different from, but also alien to previous Christian rules of truth and truths of rule, because the representation of representation as such had been problematized here historically in novel ways. This was the lesson that Foucault taught by his reading of Velasquez's painting Las Meninas, with which he introduced the order of things as well. As this new historical play of rules of truth and truths of rule gathered power and pace, so also, however, were the natures in play transformed. This new theatre of deficient natures, this theatrum mundi modern times, was rendered further unstable precisely because, I think, into it, human artifice transforms the very taking place of natures themselves, their very modes of appearance. And does so in radically contingent, unexpected, and ultimately, it seems today, in astonishingly, vertiginously unmanageable ways. Its military and political spectacles, especially, cast the human self in terms of spectator, artificer, and finally also, as mere Heideggerian reference, disposable stuff. In political terms, this very staging. The artifice and persona to which Hobbes refers, for example, in his great book Leviathan, is designed to render human beings more governable, to render human beings as governable material, by their very spectatorship on the one hand, and their artfulness on the other. Consider how in the Doctor speech to Leviathan, for example, the spectator's gaze is transfixed by the visage of the sovereign, and that the sovereign is a visage for which they all fall. They seem stupefied by it, and they are meant to be so. Hobbes knew what he was doing, and he was as influenced by optics as, and, and, and modern science at his time as he was by the religious controversies in which he lived. Transfixed by the abstract gaze of the sovereign, its eyes are empty and unseeing, its visage a death mask, they fall for its promise of security. Put differently, the very organisation of the theatre of politics around the gaze of the sovereign is designed to keep subjects fixated in precisely this way. That's an early Baroque spectacle of power, just there in the frontispiece to the Bible. Go look at it that way. For this way, they are rendered governable, at least governable by these means, because politically subjectified by its ordering things. But if the Baroque was a changing field of formation and problematization, driven by surfaces of friction, and fastening on to different points of application, including also governmental ones, its politics, distinguished by stagecraft, as much as by statecraft, expressing many changing forms of theatricality and spectacle, its able to very ordering of political order, it's possible to distinguish the early Baroque, saturated with religious motifs in political form, and political motifs in, in, in religious form, but Protestant and Catholic, it's possible to differentiate that from the later Baroque of the 19th century through to the mid 20th century. And then, after I want to say, after the midpoint of the last century, we begin to be influenced and, sub uh, and subjected to the emergence of a new Baroque political aesthetic. So, the 19th to the 20th century Baroque, I want to call Baroque politics of the age of mechanical reproduction another reference to Walter Benjamin, and to the scopic regimes and so on that Benjamin uh, interrogates in, in, in that essay on the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. But I want to experiment with the thought that we've entered another Baroque age, that of the Neo-Baroque, or the New Baroque, which is based not on mechanical reproduction, but on codified, ciphered invention in which the sign has been abstracted and divorced from the signified, and in which orders of, uh, distributed orders of signification have proved to be capable of producing new things. Baroque sovereignty. 
One answer to the problematization of politics, government, and rule posed by practical rather than soteriological finitude was, of course, that of modern sovereignty. Modern sovereignty gave concrete political form to this practical finitude. How? Well, the sovereigns replaced God. This essay here today concerns how modern sovereignty, seeking escape from the apparatic anxiety and terror of sovereign decision, to the ever more baroque and militarized architecture of modern power relations, mourns the catastrophic outcomes of its own decision making in equally baroque self justification. It's the way in which sovereign machination and criminality, given over to intrigue, characteristically also wraps itself in the full religiosity of baroque self pitying that especially intrigues me and captures my, uh, my attention. The most notable contemporary examples of which, Bosch and Blair. I don't have time to touch on Blair and his pathos and self-justification. I don't for your entertainment. And I'll go back to the Watergate tapes and recall Richard Nixon for you. If Blair is full of pathos, a kind of, oh, woe is me. This modern sovereign is also full of pathos. Now, pathos is pathos when it turns into blasphemy, badmouthness, and sheer, crude, banal, uh, not even self pitying. It just becomes dirty. Yeah, that's an action. And I recommend you go listen to the Horsegate tapes. The two most radical things I ever did as a teacher were these. First of all, made my students listen to Eisenhower's farewell address. If you've never listened to it, you can see it on YouTube. Just watch it on YouTube, better even than reading or listening to it. Go and see it on YouTube. It today appears as the most incendiary of political critiques. Now, here's, a, here's a general, here's a president. His farewell address bears repetition and updated. Day. That was the first thing I did. My students were just stunned. Well, they were only 22 years old. In there was this old guy in black and white from the 50s giving this radical political critique of what was happening to the United States under its militarization and so on. That was the first thing I did. And the second thing I did was make them, uh, make them listen to the Watergate tapes. Because they, because, because they were taped, and you can listen to them. And they're shocking. And you should always be reminded of how shocking and pathetic sovereignty can be. So I'll do that, and then I don't. But ten I'll, minutes to go. I've got ten minutes to go. I think I could just come that. Only by dividing time into the temporality of the instant of decision and the temporality of succession of the supposed unproblematic legislation of sovereign will into the historical actuality of a unitical political order. Can the sovereign myth that sovereign's reign and government's rule be positive and sustained? This artifice allies every problematic boundary distinction that it institutes and with which historical orders of sovereign power have struggled since time in memoria. Trying to ally and being fated to fail at allying their metaphysics and their mechanics. The homogeneity to which they appeal and the heterogeneity in which they persist. The hierarchy they seek to institute and the heterarchy with which they struggle. How they seek to reign, but also have to rule. Sovereignty versus government. Strategy versus tactics. Policy versus administration. Friend versus enemy. Contingency versus necessity. Inequality versus equality. And so on, and so on, and so on. Sovereignty as a field of formation, riven by these, uh, by these rifts and ruptures, which it cannot overcome, but which it plays out endlessly. To drive home this point concerning the sovereign, and particularly Schmidt's rendition of the sovereign, in his fatedness to fail, consider also Reinhard Kozelek's summary of the early modern institution of sovereignty which supplements Schmidt by recalling that it was no mere unitical abstraction, but, to use a favorite Schmidtian expression, a concrete historical formation. Quote, the absolute ruler recognized no authority over himself than God, whose attributes in the political and historical field 
is appropriated. Other operational entailments followed logically from the conceptualization and institutionalization of modern sovereignty, and these compounded the inability of Schmidt's fractured sovereign to act the sovereign in the way demanded of it. To quote Cosella again, to meet his all encompassing responsibility, the prince had to seek the measure of his actions in their calculable effect on everyone else. The compulsion to act thus provoked the need for heightened foresight. A rational calculation of all possible consequences came to be the first political commandment of the modern sovereign. To be sovereign, to become sovereign, in particular, required the exercise of what I call the strategic calculus of necessary killing to resolve these and other related issues, not least those to do with timing and interpreting what Machiavelli had called the signs of the times. That's the distinctive capacity of the sovereign, to exercise a strategic calculus of necessary killing. Who is to live and who is to die? But more than that, because one other additional point that cannot be united is this, is this question that the sovereign also faces. How much killing is enough? How much killing is enough to satisfy the strategic calculus for which the sovereign differentiates you a friend from enemy and the institution of state and political order calls. So if you're going to found your order on the friend enemy distinction, or if you're going to found your order on the basis of a, monopoly, of a monopoly of the legitimate use of force, which is the strategic calculus of necessary killing, you have to know who to kill, and you also have to know how much killing is enough, because if you don't know where to stop, then you haven't found any juridical political order, you've merely instituted the politics of the abattoir. You may be forgiving for thinking that the experience has often grown in the last 200 to 300 years has simply been the politics of the abattoir. So these are precisely the problems to which Kozelek refers, and they were recognized from the very beginning with the institution of the concept and practices of problem sovereigns. There were, for example, as I said earlier, the very problems explored in German baroque drama. Charged not only with exercising the strategic calculus of necessary killing, but also with answering the question of how much killing is enough, every human sovereign is condemned to fail the test of sovereignty itself. Forget the rational pursuit of strategic ends. For all it has purchased, forget also the, st the strategist's condemnation of Bush and Blair for their irresponsible sovereign decision making. Strategists do not have the answer either, for no such strategic calculus of necessary killing is humanly available. And one is thereby capable of specifying how much killing is enough to realize the sovereign ends of the introduction of a stable juridical political order that such a calculus presupposes. When asked how much killing is enough, the sovereign always answers more. C.F. Tony Blair's call for military intervention against Islamic extremism in general and into the civil war in Syria in particular. Strategy, strategizing, is part of the Trump loyal of Baroque politics by which the supposed miracle of decision is performatively enacted through Baroque artifice and display. Schmidt typifies the decision as a miracle because he's operating within a cosmological understanding and a cosmological order in which such things exist. In practice, the miracle of decision is a trick that is pulled off within the artifices and by the artifices of Baroque politics. It's a performance, theatricality, and so on. Schmidt's sovereign is constitutively incapable of doing what it's supposed to do and remaining what it is supposed to be. Here, the sovereign's rule of truth, truth rule must ultimately be rendered also as the positivistic knowing, the connaissance mm -hmm. of modern strategic thought. The burgeoning of strategic thinking and its will to positivistic knowledge promises an escape to the sovereign from the aporia of sovereign decision making, but it fails as well, of course, to deliver the sovereign from it. So, sovereigns fail. They are condemned to fail. In the Greek sense of tragedy, they are fated to fail. And when exercising the very power over death of what they are said to be uniquely comprised, bound to execute the penalty of death against murderers and aliens and others alike, they fail utterly. They always fail. We've got to be ending on this. The subtitle here is, Yo, Blair, 
I don't know if you recall that, but there was Blair and Bush at some conference, I don't know what it was. And uh, Blair is sitting at the table, amongst other heads of state or prime ministers and so on. And Bush is coming in and he's passing him and he smacks him on the back and he says, Yo, Blair. And Blair you know, says, you know, Hi, George. And it seems to typify for me, as it did for the English press as well, the curious relationship there was between these two characters. Yo, Blair. Suspended in a vicious aporia, instituted by having to ally a metaphysics of creative power as decision of will, with a mechanics of rule capable of translating will into policy that renders the world governable, creating a world is one thing, governing it is another. Trashfield teaches how sovereign sorrow, mourning, for its decisional predicament is one of the prevailing tropes of the Baroque spectacle of sovereign power and its terror at its own predicament. Constituted by an aporia from which there is no escape, sovereigns are themselves terrorized by having to will the sovereign abyss rather than be devoid of sovereign will. And then they slap each other on the back in doing so. In the process, they regularly invoke a god erased by modern sovereign command from the ruthlessly imminent world of modern sovereign power as much as by a vastly overrated decline in religious faith and credulity. The radical undecidability posed by sovereignty's aporia massively elevates the imperative to decide as it threatens to overwhelm the sovereign with indecision. Fear of indecision, the complement to the reeking of bloody terror. Yo, Blair, seems to have been as much a locker room injunction to act as it was the little bro recognition of a partner in crime. The burden of undecidability clearly also disposes the sovereign to treat events as the proving ground of their capacity to rule. Be a king, Blair. Recall the attempt at sovereign pathos that Blair gave in his post war interview with the British TV talk show host Michael Parkinson. Answering yes when asked on ITV1 chat show, Parkinson, if he had sought holy intervention on the decision to participate in the, in the invasion of Iraq, he went on, he, yeah, of course, yeah. You struggle with your own conscience about it, and it's one of those situations that I suppose very few people ever find themselves in. And in the end, well, there's a judgment that, I think, if you have faith about these things, well, you realize the judgment is made by other people. And if you believe in God, it's made by God as well. And when you're faced with a decision like that, some of the decisions have been very, very difficult. Most of all because you know these people are people's lives, and in some cases, their deaths. The only way you can take a decision like that is to do the right thing according to your conscience and leave it in the hands of God. My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will it, but as you will it. Matthew 26, verses 36 to 47. Blair's pious rendition of his martyrdom on the cross of decision is, however, belied by the brute intrigue and misinformation that went into the very making of it, while slipping it also through cabinet and parliament. So another character stalks the Baroque plays of Charles Spieler and sovereignty. That of the criminally inspired tyrant, backed up also by the machinating Intriga. I'm leaving the machinating Intriga, Campbell, Alistair Campbell, or Kissinger, where uh, Nixon is concerned. We have to leave them out. Let's just stay with the main players. We expect detubination and banal blasphemies from tyrants that we will not countenance or will be shocked to hear from martyrs. Sadly, there are no Downing Street tapes to afford an insight into the grubbiness of sovereignty, intrigue, and decision making that went on in Tony Blair's court in number 10 at the time of the decision to join the Americans in the attack on Iraq. Or, I think you can gain some intimation of it in the autobiographies of some of the key actors, Alistair Campbell in particular, who uses some nice pieces of foul language in this text. There is, however, the very forgotten and vast wealth of the Watergate tapes to remind us that there's a sense of sovereign transcendence into pathos. Since most Western sovereigns today don't have what it takes to be either martyr or tyrant, but that 
I guess depends on which end of the drum you find yourself on. Consider then, and I'm going to be ending with this, this conversation that Richard Nixon had, uh, I've skipped that, ah, damn, I've skipped, I've skipped that for you because of length. Um, I'll just see how much of a decade. Oh yeah, well, I've got a little bit of conversation, don't I have all the conversation, which gets more and more foul now and more and more bizarre. It's a conversation that takes place on the eve of Nixon's resignation from the presidency as a consequence of his criminal activities, having been exposed by those two uh, courageous truth tellers uh, from the Washington Post. It's the, here, the bit I'm taking is uh, he's talking to one of his senior advisors, Charles Coulson, on the eve of resignation. <laughs> Coulson was just confided in Nixon that he had always had what he coyly described as a, a little racial prejudice. Nixon replied in comradely fashion, they were in a crisis and people need each other in crisis. And then he was not prejudiced either. But nonetheless also, now I'll quote him, nonetheless also, I've just recognised that, well, you know, all people have certain traits. The Jews have certain traits. The Irish have certain, for example, the Irish can't drink. I'm Irish Catholic from Liverpool in the UK, are you? Yeah. <laughs> but then, then he saves himself. Well, well, what you've got to remember with the Irish is they get mean. <laughs> Virtually every Irish I've known gets real mean when he drinks. Particularly the real Irish. God knows what the real Irish are. And they're more into his thing. The Italians, of course, those people, of course, they don't have their heads screwed on tight. They're wonderful people. But, and his voice trails off, and then returns a moment later to the Jews. Yeah, yeah, the Jews, well, they are just a very aggressive and abrasive and obnoxious personality. The conversation then goes on, and then he gets involved with his other advisors, and eventually he finishes up in the blue room on his knees with Henry Kissinger, praying for God's intervention. I'll skip that one. Thanks to those two professional phrases, Woodward and Burstein, we hear the brutal pathos of the Nixon presidency climax at the height of the Watergate crisis with Nixon in the confessional of the Oval Office, invoking God's grace and seeking a companion in prayer. In of all people, Henry Kissinger, who is, of course, a Jew, <laughs> and, who, and who Nixon summons to the Oval Office by shouting to Haldane, you have to forgive the language here, where's that kike Kissinger? <laughs> it's on the text. Okay, conclusion. <clears throat> Is that right? 45 minutes or so? I've got on that. Conclusion. One of the travails that stalks modern politics is the very rarity of the courage of political truth. And the very many ways in which the courage of political truth has been marginalised within and even systematically driven out of our governing institutions, both public and private, medical as well as military and economic. Driven out, not least from the institutions, pedagogical and religious, whose cherished vocation and claim to distinctive competence is said to be the pursuit of truth as such. Be that as it may, why do sovereigns fail? And why do the does pathos and pathos of those failures always connote, evoke, or otherwise conjure up the divine? And why is it that we cut such slack? to both sovereigns and government when they do so. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick, for this lively and extremely inspiring lecture. Needless to say that I would not elaborate further on what you <coughs> just said. It's much too deep and all encompassing. So that there is no way I could say anything interesting after your lecture. Um, so that you will allow me only to 
so as to organize the transition to our discussion with all of you here. We will just, you will just allow me to use my time only asking questions and only four questions in fact. And these questions are not necessarily immediately connected to your lecture today also of course but they are more they are also rooted into my readings of your work since I've been starting reading you so I remember when it was that a couple of years ago so I think I I tried to articulate in fact four questions one has to do and I already mentioned this briefly to you one has to do with your configuration of the concept of Baroque in relation to change and the issue of change. The other one has to do with the issue of finitude which you address in your most recent work. The third one has to do with the emergence, another issue which you address in your work. And the final one has to do with your personal relationship with Foucault. So in the the question of change, the question on the Baroque and, and and the issue of change. Needless to say that I, well, I don't know what you think about it. But I think the issue of change and transformation is the force that drives our interrogations and our work in some way or another. So that change is always some sort, not just a question of anxiety, but also a, a driving force for, for our own work in, in the academy. That's something so banal that I'm saying. But nonetheless, it needs to be reminded. And there is this very, there is this difficulty to, to address the issues of change and transformation. And I think this is also what you've been doing, especially during this last 15 years with these developments in terms of war and terror, for example. Uh, but there is this tricky thing that to address the question of change and transformation, we have no choice but to do it through techniques that are, in fact, techniques that are fixing change. Concepts that are eventually fixing the realities around us. So that there is this some sort of paradoxical situation in which we, we found ourselves as trying to engage with the issue of change through fixing techniques. Methodologies or not. So instead, in my own way, instead of, of asking the question of change and how to engage with change, I realized that I gradually came to ask the question of the site and location of change. Where are things changing? As it's impossible to adjust address change per se, and I would encourage you to read Bergson on this, for example. Bergson has been a, a source of inspiration for Deleuze. I came to ask the question of why this change is happening. And if we refuse to give uh, some sort of natural nature uh, and essence to things, then this change cannot happen in things. So, just to make a quick reference, and to, to, to try to make this a little bit more concrete, I came to understand, I'm personally working on these issues of terrorism and anti-terrorism, and I came to understand anti-terrorism with anti into brackets, so that you do not oppose terrorism and anti-terrorism. There is no such thing like anti-terrorism as a response to terrorism. I'm not going more in details into this, but anti-terrorism with these brackets as a site, a radically heterogeneous site of transformation of the contemporary transformation of the techniques of government. And then I come to my question. This was to try to situate it a little bit. Would your answer, would, would the Baroque, uh, is, is the Baroque emerging in your work as the answer to the question of where do we can situate or locate change. And in that case, how would you connect 
your concept of the barak and the way you configured it in relation to more concrete uh, 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 episodes we've been experiencing during disasters. I gave the example of terrorism and anti-terrorism, but there are so many other issues you would, you would uh, be able to develop. That was my first question. So is the Barak your answer to the question of the location of the change? The second question uh, has to do with, uh, in relation to this question of finitude, which you address in your work, you know, more recently. As everyone has read the thesis, I don't need to go further on what this reflection is about. <laughs> it also, it's also a possibility for me not to say mistakes about it. But I came to, uh, you write, I think, somewhere in the traduction of the book, um, this idea of the, the, the reconfiguration of the techniques of government into, let's say, the infinite secretization of the infinitude of finite things. This, this sentence struck me. Infinite, secreta infinite secretization of the infinity of finite things. And I know you've been interested in all the domains of knowledge, such as nanotechnology, computing, biology, molecular biology. You read all this, and I did too. And I think you brought me there at some point. And the way I understood this work, this research, uh, trying to understand it if you were, and to make sense of them for my own work is that I came to realize that eventually there is no such finite things. That if you look at fundamental physics or bio molecular biology or there is this move toward the infinitely small with all the the applications in terms of nanotechnology. We could also refer to uh, 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 quantum informatics here. This move towards the infinitely small so that the, the smaller you get, and you always get some life behind there. There is always something moving. So after the atoms, you got the quark, and after the quark, you're, you had the more fundamental elements, and there was always something. So, and this was, a, and I interpreted it as the the extension toward the infinitely small of the scientific and spiritual revolution that started in the 16th and 17th century with this cosmological revolution, this infinitization of the universe, to quote here Coyote. So that we then realize that there is no such finite things to govern, to know. And therefore my question is, uh, in, in, in relation to, to, to finitude, uh, uh, are we going to uh, this infinite secretization of the infinitude of finite things, or do we have an infinitization of techniques of governance as a response to this gradual discovery of the radical absence of any finite things? I don't know if I make myself clear enough. <laughs> no? I get it. Then you make it clear for me, to everyone. This is research in the making. There is no certitude. Emergence and emergencies. Well, you had this. Oh, come on, don't laugh. <laughs> You have this reflection in your work on emergence, uh, which is a well, again one one more battle thing here, uh, which is your way, one of the multiple ways in which you engage with Schmitz. Uh, and I'm on your side here to say, of course, Schmidt is someone we need to engage with. I'm here referring here to a strange discussion that happened a couple of years ago in France where some would, where some came to have such a Schmittian answer to the problem of Schmidt, saying we should not even read him. 
we should not be taught, and we should not speak about him. They're not necessarily very interesting, but some are good so. And others, like Balibar, Walker in our field, or yourself, uh, think it's important to engage with me, not just uh, for the nasty answer he gave us to politics, but also as an expression of his own time. And we know Schmidt came to define the sovereign as the one who decides on the exception. Fine. This you can find it everywhere. So this, uh, this uh, I, I, we can interpret this as the naturalization of the sovereign into the act of deciding on the exception, the act. And the act having to be understood here, at least this is my interpretation, in opposition to the very process. Or even to practice, if we understand practice as the particular process, the process that puts any agent in an active relationship with the realities out there. So I was wondering here, if and how your reflection on the, 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 the permanent transformation of the techniques of governments, forms and techniques of governments, can fit that critique of a critique of Schmidt, certainly it fits a critique of Schmidt, but if it would need fit that particular critique of Schmidt, uh, uh, that would claim that eventually what we are observing today is the demultiplication of the site of the sovereign decisions when sovereign decisions are now being delegated to machines to machines that eventually are operating the sovereign decision in multiple sites along a process which is a pro which is itself a deeply computerized process which would lead us at some point to raise the question about what does the sovereign, the Schmittian understanding of the sovereign becomes in front of the computerization of governments. And I know you've been interested in such issues like the governments and its computerization. Was that clear? <coughs> and final question. In fact, it's not yeah, it's a question, but it's more a methodological question. It's a more intimate question, I would say. <coughs> that has to do with your own relationship with Foucault and his work. We know Foucault uh, situated the radically political nature of his own work in a more specific reflection about method. They would not say it that way. But I interpret it that way. All his work from the episteme, I should say the archaeology, to the dispositive, the dispositive oriented method of research, I think it's a deep methodological reflection that has to do with how we engage with my own research so that it contributes turning this research into a radically political intervention into my contemporary aid. So of course Foucault never said that like that. This is my own configured Foucault. You're not building a lot on this particular aspect of Foucault's work with more methodological reflection. Uh, the you were quoting much more the order of things than the archaeology of knowledge, his reflection about neoliberalism and <coughs> governmentality, then the more specific developments they had about this unclear concept of the dispositive, although you were so weak to the dispositive. So I was wondering how you came to keep alive that radically political nature in your own work, building on Foucault, nonetheless leaving aside 
the more methodologically oriented nature. I don't know if this last question makes sense. I don't know if any of these questions. <laughs> <laughs> but these were bad questions. <laughs> so I'm not used to these events. So I don't know how we should proceed. <laughs> if Mick is answering these questions, because I'm sure he had answers. Or if we open the floor, we open the floor instead. Yeah. All right. Let's open the floor and then collect some questions. Uh, we have responses to uh, Philip or Paulette eventually. Yeah. In as we go. How's that? I'm very happy. I can't just that I can't see this huge thing in the way. For those of you who are my students, <laughs> but to all of you, you have questions. All right? Because we have far enough answers in this world. But very bad questions, generally. <laughs> Therefore, the bad answers. <laughs> so let's go. Well, sure, why don't you use subjects, all right? I don't need the mic. You don't need the mic? Of course you need the mic. Some of my actually questions come from our first session that we had in the morning. Sure. Uh, when you say that the spectacle is vital to modern power, yeah. I, I'm wondering uh, how is this spectacle different from the killing machine of the penal colony? If we have moved from the spectacular to the specular gaze that Foucault talks about, this return of the spectacular uh, that you are talking about, how different is it then from that killing machine? To which, you know, in another conversation, Philip says it's not the killing machine, it's the capturing machine. Uh, the delusion intensities. Mm. So, w w one is that. The second, I'm also more interested in uh, the act of truth telling. Uh, is it, you know, can we see Parisia as a form of resistance? Uh, and by resistance, I do not mean the various springs that we've had in the recent past. Uh, but I also mean uh, taking away one's life voluntarily. Is that a form of Is that a form of parisia? And then uh, even taking away one's life, I do not necessarily mean uh, uh, the suicide bombing. I also me uh, mean uh, farmer suicides against the agrarian crisis in various uh, you know, uh, uh, the neoliberal practices, so farmers committing suicide. Right. They are robbing the state of a productive body. Is that a form of resistance? Uh, then uh, another question which is sort of at the fringe of my mind, I'm not very sure if uh, this is uh, valid. You know, when you say the sovereign as the tyrant, as the martyr, as the plotter, this is in relation to the one who is governed. What is the what is the effect of the governed on the sovereign? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Shall I? Okay. I'll try not to talk for too long, and therefore allow others to. While I'm talking, think about what they might want to ask, and how they want to formulate what they want to ask. Um, so I'll try to keep my answers brief, which anybody who knows me <laughs> knows is pretty impossible. But I'll do my best. Uh, so I'll start with Shibanshu first. Um, I find it difficult to give an answer to the first question, since the, the question that you pose first, which is the nature of modern specular society and the kind of paradigms for it, penal colony or something else, are precisely what I want to go and think about and research. This is what I'm entering into to give significant uh, reflection to. Um, and it certainly has changed. A modern spectacle, modern display, and by that I don't just mean fireworks and so on, but I mean the way in which things are made manifest are brought to presence. 
at the way in which our very attention towards things is tutored and governed by the way in which they are brought to presence. Uh, as dramatically different in the digital molecular age than it used to be. So consequently, the, nature, the, spectacle, the specular nature of it is going to be different. So it won't be the penal column. Well, ah, I was going to say, it won't be the penal column. No. But that doesn't mean to say penal colonies disappear. Uh, again, as I said earlier today, uh, just as their, just as orders of power relations are plural and diverse and coexist, so also will be orders of spectacle. Would be my instinct. Okay. So, so while I would be interested, this is a point about change. I think while I'm interested in how the specular character integral to modern politics as an expression of artifice must necessarily change as artifice itself changes not just with techniques and technologies but with, with epistemologies as to say the very understanding of what representation is and how it's to be done as well as the techniques by which it's done but that's going to change as well okay so so in that sense in as much as the Baroque the reply to Philippe I uh, thank you for your comments Philippe it, yes, the Baroque is the location of an interest that I have in making more explicit the transformation and changes of governance and rule in the modern period as these are finding expressions in modes of making explicit, modes of making manifest, which has always been the business of artifice, that's what Hobbes was about as much as anyone else, but differently. And differently means in ways that we haven't quite commanded, ways that we are subjected by and subjected to, or being we think that we are in charge of that. Like Bush and Blair thought they were in charge of the war. Hmm. They were. Uh, so that, that would be my qualified reply to your first question. Uh, the, second, the second point about Palaisia and modes of resistance. I've always thought that when Foucault referred to resistance, he, he referred to uh, a kind of subjective act. Yes, I resist, as it were, mm -hmm. some expression manifestly of however it comes of resistance. But I also always figured, and I'm not giving sufficient attention to this, but it always intrigued me. I think he also understood something like this, that Things in the world, we'll come to the business of finite things in a moment, but things in the world are not in the world in order to be governed. Governance is something that is brought to things in the world. So that the nature of the property of things in the world is not that of being amenable to governance. They have to be fashioned by and made amenable to governance. So that the nature of things in the world is also opaque and changing. He says somewhere, doesn't he, something like discourse is violence, or knowledge is violence that can do things in the world. Implicit, I think, in Foucault is an understanding of things in the world resisting, not because they seek to resist, but because they are a form of materiality that is itself not meant to be governed. So when they are governed, they resist, but they resist not out of any subjective will or intent, but they can resist just merely out of the fact that they weren't made to be governable. I think there's an element of that in Foucault. And that's always clear to me. Well, it's a complex thing to unravel. I think it's there. But he's also interested in, in, in resistance as, as a kind of expression of his subjective will. Okay, so paresia. That's tricky. Uh, I think, because yes it is, in one sense it is, but resistance is such a modern concept, it's a modern trope, okay, now very much, one of the reasons I'm standing up is partly because I'm small, and therefore if I stand up and you're sitting down you can't see me. The other reason why I'm standing up is because I'm a natural amateur dramatist, and this is a theatre, and there's no use pretending that what we're engaged in is not itself also a spectacle, as well as also a curious kind of power relation. You're sitting down listening and now standing up talking. And I've got the mic. <laughs> in Greek, this would be called the spectrum. Huh? You have that in your hand, you can speak. <laughs> you don't have it yet. 
So think about getting it. <laughs> All right. So Palesia is slightly different, I think, and I'm not. I, 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 I'm absolutely fascinated by Palesia. And since I finished one book and I'm thinking of where I go, I'm not thinking of where I go next. To be perfectly honest, I'm impelled by. I, I, I'm a totally anarchical kind of curious, uh, curiosity curiosity <coughs> picker. So it's whatever draws my attention, whatever I'm captured captured by. Uh, and Palesia and the Courage of Truth, which I will ally to a hugely disputed and controversial term that we call allies to Palesia, which is political spirituality. And with my colleagues and friends back at Lancaster, in the reading group that I share with them, and on which I depend while well, I'm in Lancaster for intellectual sustenance and friendship, I've, I've speculated for two possible lines of writing from now on, two possible short books. One would be by rap poetry, and the other would be political spirituality. I was telling uh, people attending the seminar earlier that I'm just about to co-edit a uh, book series with Bloomsbury Press in the UK on political theology, so, so my co-editors would like me to write this curious text on political spirituality, but I'm deeply intimidated by that. Spirit is a big word, uh, uh, and I'm not sure I've got to it. <laughs> but, but political spirituality, Adensia, connected. This is, this is more, not an answer to you, but where would I go if I was thinking more about it than I am? Uh, and you know that Foucault used the term political spirituality when he was referring to, uh, when he was in uh, Iran, in Tehran, in 1978-39, and he wrote about this in his newspaper reports, and he got absolutely uh, criticised for it. But he has his finger on something, as he always did. Uh, what, and then how to unpack that, and how does that relate to truth, and the courage of truth, and how does that relate to the willingness to die, or to expose oneself to death, in bearing witness to, or in the pursuit of truth, ah, we're in the midst of a world in turmoil in which that is at the very forefront of global politics. And it's not being effectively addressed in the West at all. Seems to me. It's being addressed in the worst possible way. Okay. So that would be that would be my, res my response to you. They're not they're, they're recognitions of the significance of what you're asking rather than uh, rather than replies to you. Yeah, then. I'm pausing. I should I should go into the wings when I give you an opportunity. Sorry, I'm chairing my... Gee, this is typical. This is Napoleonic instinct to me. I'm chairing. I'm chairing. Very good. I am <laughs> myself. If you want to take another question, yeah. I know Rocco has a question. Okay. Yeah. Let's do that. Okay, actually, I have two questions. On one side, uh, to, to bring things to, to, to everyday experience, let's say. For example, the Belgian government recently proposed to start EU data mining at the the information about the energy consumption or water consumption of uh, potential uh, social benefit um, users, so to identify fraud, yeah. and a classical case of uh, profiling to some extent. Yeah. And it's quite interesting for me, like to what extent, like this uh, machine uh, de capture or um, new technology is, is nothing more than normal mundane technology that is also used and repurposed for a different kind of uh, of government. And on the second case, my question is always like, uh, um, and what if uh, it was just like a stage in the sense that uh, I'm not sure that, the, that this, we always assume that this machine, this government machine is uh, efficient to some extent. That's the reason why we need to criticize it. Uh, but what if it's not efficient at all and it's just like glory or, or theater? Uh, what if uh, we don't need resistance because uh, it's just a failure? So resistance will be just redundant. Yeah. Uh, how we can frame this within your yeah. um, The version of that is that I mean, these systems screw up all the time. Um, they are stated to fail, as it, as I've argued. Sovereignty is stated to fail. Uh, 
but perhaps for different reasons, because they, because they operate differently. One of the features of these systems, as I'm sure you know uh, very well, is that they recognize that they are fated to fail, uh, in as much as they are recognized by their inventors and their managers as complex and adaptive systems. Here's the paradox, they have to be complex and adaptive in order to be efficient, but since they are complex and adaptive, uh, the criterion efficiencies are difficult to apply to them, which is why they've invented a different term, which is that of resilience, which is not quite the same as efficiency. Efficiency is a measurement of input-output ratios, and resilience is a measurement of something else, or a, a will to something else, which is the capacity to reform oneself in the context of challenges and uncertainties and unpredictabilities which are actually part of the system itself. So that all of these systems understand themselves to be premised upon the fact that they don't know their original conditions and they don't know the unanticipated consequences of their operationalization of them. And at least to the extent that I, 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 I talk to people who run them as well as investigated the, the literature around them, that's absolutely central to their conceptualization. Um, now that's interesting because they know that they fail. I'll give you one little illustration. It's not to do with data mining, but it's to do with civil defense in the UK for the deal, you know, what would be called homeland security in the United States, civil defense in the UK. Uh, as to do with the training of civil defense workers for responding to complex emergencies and crises, catastrophic events. And well, once they used to be trained in terms of scenarios where you would say, this is the emergency, and then these are the things you have to do to deal with that emergency, and then they're trained to do that. They're not trained to do that any longer. It is assumed that the emergencies that they will have to deal with will be outside of their existing technical competences. And therefore, they're trained to adapt, not to apply their technical competences, but they're actually trained in scenarios which, where, they're, where, where, they're, where the managers of the scenario, the managers of the games, deliberately change the rules in the course of the game so that the game's players, who are the civil defense workers who are being trained to deal with emergencies, develop resilient, adaptive strategies in response to events that are utterly unpredictable on the grounds that that's what's going to be required rather than the application of some preformed competences and preformed templates to deal with to deal with uh, known or predictable events. What is presupposed now is that events are not normal in advance and that the outcome of them are not prescribable in advance and that what is therefore required is, is a set of capacities that are not those merely of learning how to deal with pre, uh, prescribed and prejudged uh, events. So I think that's part of it. But can I use that then to come back to uh, uh, one of the points that, um, a second point that, that Philippe has made? And, and okay, so where is change located? It's, it's, it seems to be located, well, one of the areas of interest I have is where change is located. That's how I paraphrasing your first uh, reflection. Now, one of the areas of which it is located is precisely in relation to what is now generally, this is the received wisdom now of, it seems to me, of these disseminated systems and distributed systems that we'll come back to in a moment, uh, that are dominant governing institutions in our lives recognition or the acceptance of received wisdom that change is a datum. That's, yeah, you begin with change, you don't begin with what is, you begin with things will be different. You don't begin with what is, what is, what is in terms of what you've got because although you have some sense of what it is you have available, what your systems are like, how your, how your, your, your management of of water supply, how your management of energy, and so how the financial systems work. Actually, you don't 
You don't know what their origins were in any great detail, and you cannot predict all of the unexpected perturbations, combinatorial, recombinatorial dynamics that they display. So change is a function of recognizing that, that you live in a world of constant flux and change in these ways. That's where it's located. It's located in the way in which our artifice and the systems and products of our artifice are always themselves inadequate to the very areas of existence that they claim to govern and control. And I think that in general terms is why the term resilience was invented. It's a kind of catch-all term uh, to nail the point that therefore competence has to be somehow to do with being able to change one's form. Now this, this relates back to the huge point, I think, in terms of the infinitization of finite things. I know it sounds a bit mystical, but <laughs> in, in a certain sense it's, it's, it's straightforward. Um, and you're absolutely right. You can't find finite things anymore, but what, and the reason you can't find them is that the focus has shifted not to entities as if they exist in the world that are measurable, quantifiable, and that have properties that one can enumerate, and therefore you've got the thing. The emphasis has shifted to those processes by which things are created and invented. So it's emergency. Yeah. So in, I cottoned on to this when I gave my last gloss to my book. Because I was really rather captured by that phrase, the infinite government of finite things. I mean, you know, I could see that having purchased a game in circulation, because it seemed, it seemed to me to, to summarize quite tightly one of the points I wanted to make. And I went through the last editing of the book before I submitted it to the publishers and changed it. And I, I started to change the infinite government of finite things to the infinite government of processes of formation, invention, and creation which produce things, but it's not the things that are of interest. It's the morphological processes, mm -hmm. the very process by which things come to presence, the very processes by which things are invented. Now, this is all very abstract, but that's located in molecular science. So molecular scientists, molecular biology, is not interested in things in the sense of organisms anymore. It's interested in the chemical, informational, combinatory, and recombinatory processes by which things come to presence. And by which things come to presence in the world that have never previously been seen in the world. This is not a matter of uncovering things in nature, entities, you, me, sheep, cows, cats, dogs. It's not a matter of uncovering them. It's a matter of cracking the code by which such things come to be formed. And when you crack the code by which things come to be formed, you understood the code. You can recombine the code to produce things that were never known in nature previously. That's where molecular biology is gone. And that's its fascination. But it's replicated, it's replicated throughout many other systems of formation and government, which is why I call it neo baroque the new baroque new artifice, and it's new not because of just the fantastic technologies, it's new because the very idea of representation itself has shifted. It's not a matter of representation in the age of mechanical reproduction. Here is a thing, make a copy of it, 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 make a copy of it. And with what then takes place when you have extraordinary systems of copy. This is the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. It's not that any longer. This is an age in which the very morphological, morphological just means how things are formed, the very morphological processes by which things come to presence are the focus of scientific and governmental attention. And so, <laughs> the, the, the finite things are less important, and in a curious sense, even more finite, because they come and go so much more quickly, that their very finite presence is, is, is a 
It's almost a fleeting moment. Think of what's going on in CERN as they try to as they try to <laughs> to capture that fleeting moment where uh, the, the what's it frozen, that particular particle that they're looking for, so frozen. Yeah, flying around the tubes. It's that mo that very fleeting moment when the thing is there. But actually, actually, the thing itself is less important in a way uh, than what they learn about the processes um, and and and. and Morphological dynamics of the creation of materiality as such. That's that's why I call it the neo So yes, change. Yes, that infinitization of finite things is shifted to almost to the infinitization of processes of morphological intervention. Because it's not that the processes of creation and invention are themselves finite, they're not. They're not. They are subject to continuous scientific transformation and change. Scientists can do things now that they didn't, were capable of doing before. Um, and therefore can produce things that were never seen in nature before. They go Dolly the sheep. Which was created by molecular scientists. Of course. Um, well, thank you for your lecture. Um, I was listening to you and I thought I had a question about change, but I think it's more about resistance again, which is always the million dollar question. But um, um, listening to you, it seems that um, resistance, or, resistance or, or change becomes even more important when failure is being reoriented or is being appropriated um, or is feeds into the adaptive system. So we have adaptive systems, uh, resilient systems. Things are always emergent. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. what does this leave us, um, what is the alternative in that sense? And I think that is why Roka's question is, is perhaps interesting because, because it, it formulated some sort of alternative. We look at when systems still fail, even though they acknowledge that they can fail. Um, so, I'm wondering where that, <coughs> if, if this is also why we want to, to study um, these type of, of, yeah. of power relations and forms of government, where those alternatives lie for us to yeah. Yeah. Lovely, yeah, lovely, thank you. Um, it's a good question. Um, and I'm thinking on my feet here, you know, you mustn't, you mustn't think that I have this all stored in my head. <laughs> uh, the reason I can't do this when I should be at home to play with my grandchildren. <laughs> Which I do do too, <laughs> is because this is so stimulating to what I remain captured and passionate about. Okay, resistance. Uh, which one? Which form? How? Okay. So, so you see the book going me immediately. Which one? Uh, which I shouldn't. I should have said to right away to the shoe. Shoe brown. Yeah, uh, as well. It's which one? I don't have an answer to which one, but one has to understand that there are, you know, there are many, many different expressions, forms, and so on of resistance. Hitler was a form of resistance. So, you, you, so, so, so to embrace resistance is kind of naive. You've got to ask which one, and which one would you ally yourself with? It's it difficult, yeah. and how? The point about suicide, which others call martyrdom. And martyrdom is not a preserve of Islam, as you well know. There's a huge tradition within the Christian tradition of martyrdom. And in fact, if any of you could ever be positive, why should I don't know, watch the Member of the Sunday ceremonies held in the UK on the anniversary of the end of the First World War. Uh, the whole vocabulary of remembrance is to do with martyrdom, so called, of the hundreds of thousands and millions who met their death for a war which now, frankly, uh, seems so archaic it's hard to associate with it. So, so martyrdom, suicide, you, you might say <laughs> one man's terrorist or one woman's terrorist is another person's Freedom fighter, huh? Okay, well, one person's suicide is another person's martyrdom. It's a complicated business, this. Okay, so resistance, which one? 
uh, and related it to change. Yes, since since if I go back to my first observation about my sense that Foucault has a sense of things that just are resistant simply because they're not built, as it were, to take the government that then is put upon them. The way I used to teach that to my students when I first got that kind of insight, I'm not sure it works, but anyway, I'll give it to you, is that, uh, is that um, copper wire, <laughs> which transmits electricity, is not built to take electricity. The silicone chip, which transmits electricity, is a conductor, in short. The copper wire is a conductor. But they weren't made to conduct. Just happens to be the case that they could not. That is why, conversely, they have resistance. That's, I think, I got that intuition from Foucault, okay? That some, that stuff that is not made to do the job for which it is put, resists simply because it's not made to do that job. And therefore it has to be adapted and it has to be governed. And, and every one of you has got a laptop computer and every one of you, when you switch on your laptop computer, <coughs> can hear the fan. And what's the fan doing? Well, it's cooling down the chip. Why? Because the manifestation of the resistance of the chip, however much of a conductor it is, the manifestation of the resistance of the chip is heat. And the fan cools it back. That's the governance of the resistance of the chip. Yeah. It, that's, there's that aspect of resistance in Foucault, which is not to do with intention or will, but is to do with regulation and instrumentalization and so on. But there is one that's to do is one, uh, to do with change as transformation, and this enables me to uh, come back to, uh, <laughs> yeah, to, uh, to my, I love that, my personal <laughs> relationship with Michel Foucault, because okay, I never met him, uh, I didn't even begin to read him until the poor man was long dead. Um, when you met him? I don't think so, I never met him, he works. Hmm? Oh, well, yes, 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 I, uh, yeah, yeah, I met him in the books and was immediately seduced and captured by him. Uh, and that was when, and that was when I had never read any philosophy at all. Because I'd been trained in international relations, and the international relations I was trained in in those days was absolutely theory-phobic, and absolutely philosophy-phobic, if you never got any of it. It was kind of newspaper description of what governments do. Um, <laughs> and that's how, you know, anyway, less said about those days, better. Anyway, there's such ancient history. But, but when I got completely dissatisfied with all of that, having been working closely in government at that time, we're talking about the early 1980s, uh, I was trying to describe something which was the Falklands, or uh, Falklands Maldinas War. And I was trying to describe that because I'd write a book on it. And what hit me most when I was looking at that conflict was how on April the 1st, 1982, Britain and Argentina were close allies and great friends. And we got on famously and there was no problem whatsoever. By on April the 3rd, three days later, Argentina was the great enemy and Galtieri was a, was, was a, a kind of a, a Latin form of Hitler. Massive, I didn't even have these vocabulary available for me myself then, a massive transformation of discursive and framing of the war. <coughs> you see what we do, Foucault can do to you. <laughs> I didn't have that vocabulary available then. I never even heard of Foucault. But I was trying to explain that shift in the very language which constitutes the better reality for the government then of what was taking place. And I happened to ask a friend of mine who was in a management school, the least likely place, you might think, to find somebody who'd read Foucault oh. and Lacan. Oh. Yeah, strange guy. He also came from Liverpool, I have to tell you. So. Uh, <laughs> Liverpool is a strange place. Um, so I asked him, I've got to explain this ship, how do I do it? He said, you need to go and read Foucault. Who? He said, Foucault. It's in the library, go read. Which is the only advice I've got for anyone. It's in the library. Go read. So I did, and I took down. Um, actually, it was the order. Of, it was wasn't the order of things. It was his inaugural lecture at the College of France. Oh, because my friend had directed me to orders of discourse. 
I can remember to this day sitting down with that text in the library and reading it, and two things simultaneously. I didn't understand the word. It was written in such a vocabulary and from such a perspective, I, I didn't understand the word. But, and I, I had an advantage here, but I was amazed at how clearly this guy understood power relations. It was as if he had been at NATO headquarters. Mm -hmm. It was as if he had been in the Ministry of Defence that I had been. It was as if he had shared the privilege that I had of sitting in on the formulation of defence white papers. This guy knew what was I couldn't. <laughs> I had this tremendous impact on me of this guy is all over my territory. <laughs> I had to learn how he speaks. I had to learn conceptually what he said. And I used to come with my students with that experience when I then introduced them to people, yeah? which you can imagine in 1982-83 was a bit of a shock to me uh, in a department of international <laughs> relations in the northwest of England, oh, you know, which basically taught American ideology. So, so change, transformation, my personal relation with Foucault, the political, the small p project that was and, and remains Foucault and his work. Um, you, you, you touched on the sore and tender spot uh, because, because it is a political project. Um, I feel attracted to it for these very reasons. Uh, uh, that's to say, um, reading him enabled me to make my escape from international relations, as it was then taught, you know, and then turned me into a kind of resistor or um, <laughs> a violent critic of my colleagues in those days. Um, but that raises the question of change for what? That raises the question of resistance for what? Uh, not just which one and how, but for what? And so back to change, back to transformation, and the problem of the change that you want, the change that you would welcome, uh, the change that you would like to initiate, or protect, as opposed to that which you would want to resist. And, and I think Foucault had a very profound sense, and I would say our circumstances today in our neo-Baroque politics are even more intensely like this than ever before. The difficulty of being able to figure out where you would like things to go, what virtues you would like to see practiced, and I deliberately introduced the term virtue, you know, or to deal with the vocabulary of normativity and so on. What virtues you would espouse, and how do you work them into your own pedagogical practice and into your own practices of writing? In Foucault's terms, I think that's something to do with ascesis, as opposed to normativity. Or in, or in terms I was using this morning, and in terms to which I'm attracted at the moment, because it's a term of art, I think I can make use of. It's a matter of the decorum that you contrive for yourself. How you make yourself manifest in as much as you do and can, and you can't control for it. I have no idea what you're thinking as you're looking at me, and as you're judging me, and, and, and as you're thinking about what I'm saying. No idea, I can't control for it. I'm simply on stage and taking the risk that maybe there's something here that, that will resonate with you. Uh, but today, it's a, in our civilization, that of the North Atlantic Basin, extremely difficult to know what to hope for. Extremely difficult to know in which direction you'd want the multiple changes that are the foundation now and the drivers of this civilization through the disseminated systems of of, of, of the sovereign signifier in combination and recombination, continuously producing and inventing new formations of existence, in relation to which our constitutional capacities established in the 17th and the 18th century are manifestly incapable of managing. So, the revolutionaries of the 18th century did have an eschatological idea of where they wanted to go and what they wanted to do. You know, heaven on earth, that kind of thing. Today we don't. And at the same time, we're all saying, 
living in an insolvent government subject to the governance of a vastly complex, radically disseminated systems of significatory power and power relations, which in a sense are detached from the old idea of the sign and the signifier. Because the signifiers don't matter anymore. What matters is the power of combination and recombination <coughs> that at one time I called recombinant biopolitics. It's that power of invention. And then what would you want to do with it? It's a Promethean problematic. You know, Prometheus, the guy who stole those things from the gods because he felt sorry for the humans. So he gave us fire and other techniques. That's the story of Prometheus. And then the gods got pissed off at him for doing that and then changed it to a rock and had a bird eat out his liver all the time. But you know, the, the myth is, is an important one. Uh, one of the things that they don't tell you about the myth is, well, thanks, Prometheus. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> we, are, we are our own artifice and we are, we are astonishing inventive creatures. Fearful now of our own inventiveness. The tragedies, it seems to me, speak more to our condition than even Benjamin's charge me. We've got another question. Sit two. So, what time is it? It's four. It's almost four. So, either there is an ultimate and urgently important question. Or a final word uh, from you. This means a final word. I hope that we don't do some final word. I'm sort of struck by the opening of the Bible. Picks the Bible, picks the Old Testament. In the beginning was the word. Uh, the okay. In the beginning was the word. And in this great, in this great problem, um, almost tragic condition that they think that late modern civilization of the North Atlantic Basin finds itself in, and uh, with a tremendous lack of faith in its system. Uh, in the beginning was the word. If the word was the last word, why would we have created such massive word-making machines? <laughs> uh, that's my response to. Uh, to despots and to uh, fundamentalists. If in the beginning was the word, and that's all you needed, well, we've had 3,000 years of making bloody words, you know? And in other words, we are sign, sign makers. Um, so that's one way of shooting myself up. No last word, but except for thank you. Uh, I've enjoyed this, and it's been good for me. And I wish that Philippe had given me his questions before I sent my final manuscript into the publishers. Because there's some wonderful little glasses that I'd like to put into it. But, uh, and I've had the opportunity, I want to thank him for that. So, that's my final word. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you for uh, having spent this afternoon, this whole day, with you, and my apologies for not having been here this morning. How do you call that? The public lecture series <laughs> will return soon, <laughs> February 2015. I'm reading what has been given to me. <laughs> there are two lectures scheduled on February 4, between 2 and 4 p.m. <laughs> by Professor Moya Lloyd from Marlborough University, UK. Who counts, question mark, the political problem of the human? Big problem. <laughs> and second day, actually you didn't mention the date for the other one. No, it's the same day. It's the same day. <laughs> Dr. Das Gupta from GNU University in New, New Delhi, in India. The political and the refugee perspective. All this on February 4 from 2 to 4 p.m. Thank you again, and please join me to thank uh, Mike again.